It's a pleasure um, for me to introduce to you Rachel Cruz. Um, Rachel Cruz is an, a certified nurse practitioner who works with Dr. Shivink uh, here in the Department of Neurosurgery at Cedars Sinai. Um, she um, she went to UCLA for her bachelor's degree and Regis College for her master's degree. Um, her topic, um, I think, will be of great interest um, on both sides, both the patient track and here, um, considerations in conception, pregnancy, and childbirth. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Connie. Good morning, everyone. Okay, so uh, no disclosures. So SIH is uh, rarely described in pregnancy. Um, it's poorly recognized and underdiagnosed, and it's because headaches, nausea, vomiting are common symptoms of the first trimester. So it can be misdiagnosed for migraines, hyperemesis gravidarum, uh, venous sinus thrombosis, even pseudotumor cerebri. So there's limited evidence showing that there's an underlying mechanism uh, predisposing SIH in pregnant women. Um, as Dr. Mogakar said in his previous lecture, there could be physiological changes in intracranial pressure and CSF volume during pregnancy, but the precise nature of that is unclear. So as most of you know, MRI is the preferred diagnostic modality in pregnancy. There's no reported adverse maternal or fetal effects from MRI during pregnancy. Um, gadolinium is generally not recommended, but it can be used if necessary. An MRI brain without gadolinium can show brain sagging, subdural fluid collection, sterile thickening. And then MRI myelogram of the entire spine without gadolinium can also show meningeal diverticula, and extradural CSF collections, as Dr. Chauvinck uh, showed in his previous lecture. So um, that's the first diagnostic test we would probably order. And then digital subtraction and CT myelography. Um, there's no high-quality studies in pregnant women uh, from which to service data on the risks of radiation on the fetus. Therefore, there are possible adverse effects on the neonate, and that's multifactorial, right? It depends on the gestational age of the fetus, uh, the time of the radiation, the dose. Um, so nevertheless, there are no lethal radiation doses to the fetus. So it can be performed in diagnostic workup, um, but it's, you know, usually we recommend to defer digital subtraction and CT myelography after the pregnancy. So how do you, you worked up your patient uh, who's pregnant with orthostatic headaches or other associated symptoms, uh, how do you manage and treat it? So of course, conservative measures, so IV fluids, caffeine, bed rest, although with bed rest, you wanna be leery because you know pregnant women are at increased risk of DVTs, so generally we would avoid that. And then of course, the current definitive treatment is epidural blood patching. So in pregnant women, it's safe to use iodinated contrast. Animal studies haven't reported any teratogenic or mutagenic effects from its use. Um, additionally, we would avoid fluoroscopy, uh, but it can be used. Uh, various techniques can be used to self uh, guard the fetus, um, such as modifying the exposure time, the image area, limiting the amount of images you obtain. And then, of course, surgery for CSF leak repair. So laminectomy for dural tears, and then you have the foraminotomy for meningeal diverticula, and, of course, the direct CSF venous fistula. So now that you've worked up your patient, um, you treated them, what if they develop rebound high pressure after treatment? So with acetazolamide, it's generally avoided in liberal use, but it remains a treatment option in pregnant women. Uh, Dr. Freeman spoke at a grand rounds yesterday, and she recommended to avoid acetazolamide until after the first trimester. Uh, ferrosamide also treats heart failure in pregnant women, uh, but we do recommend to monitor fetal growth because it it can increase birth weight. Additionally, dandelion tea, uh, it's considered safe to use in pregnancy, uh, according to the German Commission E and the American Herbal Products Association. So the million dollar question, uh, your patient is pregnant, has a CSF leak, should they choose vaginal versus cesarean uh, section delivery? And of course there are advantages and disadvantages from an OB-GYN standpoint, but in the context of SIH, both are reasonable options. 
Um, so pharmacologic approaches uh, towards managing childbirth pain can broadly be classified in systemic analgesia, and then you have local regional. So I'm going to be focusing more on regional analgesia, which is the epidural spinal anesthesia, and then general analgesia. So there are multiple advantages to regional. Uh, so general is, you know, it's reasonable option, but it's not necessary. You could do a spinal uh, if, the, if the patient chooses a cesarean section delivery. It minimizes maternal morbidity, allows a mother to be awake for the birth, it minimizes intraoperative systemic medication, and then of course you avoid intubation. So if your patient decides to choose uh, C-section under spinal, um, it is a reasonable option because the diameter and needle tip are very small, so it, it's designed to minimize the leak of CSF. So with spinal anesthesia, uh, anesthesiologists commonly use a 26 gauge needle. Um, also, it's pencil point, therefore it reduces the chance of a postural puncture headache. Versus an epidural, if you have an accidental dural puncture, the needle that's typically used is a 17 or 18 gauge, and it's a curved opening at the tip. So the hole that you make with an unintentional dural puncture from an epidural is larger than that of a spinal. So as you can see here with the Whitaker and the Spraddle needles, those are both spinal needles. Uh, you can see that's pencil point. Uh, the holes are on the side, the diameter is smaller. And then with the Tuhi needle with an epidural, the diameter is larger and it's curved right here. So you, you can imagine that the hole is bigger if there is an unintentional dural puncture during epidural anesthesia. So in summary, there are advantages to both spinal and epidural anesthesia. Um, the disadvantages are much smaller than that of an epidural. So generally, we recommend the spinal. So the first case study, uh, JH is a 29-year-old female. She's a first grade teacher. She suffered from a gradual onset of an unusual headache in October 2016. Her headaches were worse with Valsalva, any exertional activity, and it occurred within one minute of assuming an upright position. It was relieved within two minutes of lying, two minutes of lying supine. Of note, she did see a chiropractor in February 2017 who performed neck adjustments for twice a week for six weeks. She presented to our clinic in June 2018. Her brain MRI showed subtle findings of brain sagging, some minimal pachymeningeal enhancement. Her cervical spine showed a an extensive lateral in leak in the cervical spine and also in the thoracic spine. So she underwent a blood patch in June 2018. Uh, her headache significantly improved, but she was not 100%. She was unable to repeat the brain and spine MRI, but she found out she was pregnant two months later. Uh, so her headaches, interestingly, resolved within the first trimester. And then she decided to proceed with vaginal delivery with an epidural. There were no complications from that. So during labor, she felt increased head pressure, but denied any lingering headaches. And currently, she has occasional minimal head pressure that's noticeable, but tolerable, and her MRI scans are pending. So this is an interesting case, because this is a patient who had a leak. Uh, she had a blood patch. She found out she was pregnant. And interestingly, like Dr. Mogukar said in his speech, that there is this uh, uh, link between fluid retention and CSF volume. So interestingly, her headaches just spontaneously resolved on its own. Secondly, uh, she did undergo vaginal, and contrary to popular belief, you would think if you if a patient had a leak and they proceed with vaginal, that they would have a reoccurrence of the leak. And with her, you know, even though she's still having minimal head pressure, she did very, very well after delivery. Uh, another case study, SM is a 29-year-old female. She has a history of chronic headaches, but she suffered from a gradual onset of a daily persistent headache during the third trimester of her pregnancy in November 2018. So this is a patient who had a leak while she was pregnant. Her headaches were relieved when sleeping on a recliner couch. She was unable to lie flat due to other associated symptoms. She underwent a vaginal delivery of her son with an epidural. There were no complications with that. And then her headaches worsened after she delivered her child, which prompted a brain MRI, which showed findings of SIH. So she presented to our clinic in May 2019. So her brain MRI showed brain sagging, uh, pituitary enlargement, some meningeal thickening. And then her MRI myelogram showed a ventral CSF leak, mainly in thoracic spine at T12. So we operated on her, a T12 laminectomy, repair of the ventral uh, leak in May 8, on May 8, 2019. 
Two days later, she had a post-operative MRI scan, and that showed complete resolution of the uh, CSF leak. So between May and July, uh, she did very well. She, did, she had two episodes of low-pressure type headaches that spontaneously resolved. And then December, she found out she was pregnant with her second child. So um, she's currently 14 weeks pregnant. She wishes to proceed with C-section under general. So this is a, an interesting case study that she had a leak during her pregnancy. We operated on her. She did very well. Um, and you know, C-section under general anesthesia is a reasonable option, considering that her headaches did worsen after vaginal delivery of her first child. So these are just preoperative and postoperative scans. Uh, these are preoperative brain MRI, postoperative brain MRI. You can see that the leak um, is resolved on her postoperative MRI scan, and this is the ventral dural tear during surgery. So general anesthesia. So if your patient decides to proceed with C-section under general versus spinal, it's not necessary, but it's reasonable. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages to both. So uh, if they do proceed, we recommend that they use a glide scope during intubation to avoid hyperextension of the neck and trauma to the dura. Some disadvantages of general anesthesia are risk of aspiration, um, and also it's not as effective as spinal anesthesia in pain relief post cesarean section delivery. But you can ask, uh, the patient can ask the anesthesiologist to perform a tap block or a transverse abdominis plane block, single or continuous, which I have a couple case studies later on that show that it provided adequate post-delivery pain relief. So in the postpartum period, uh, lactation, if you want to repeat the MRI scans, you can uh, use gadolinium. Um, it's uh, present at very low levels in human milk, and it's not absorbable by the infant gut. So less than 0.004% of the contrast is actually absorbed by the breastfeeding infant. It's not necessary, but you can do that uh, for post-procedure or operative imaging. And then if you want to proceed with the digital subtraction myelogram, the CT myelogram, iodinated contrast media uh, can be used. They don't have to pump and dump, but generally it's recommended to discontinue breastfeeding for 24 hours. And then rebound high pressure in the postpartum period. So acetazolamide is safe to use in lactating women. There's low concentrations in breast milk and infant serum. Uh, methazolamide, there's no studies that show that it's excreted in breast milk, so generally we would avoid that. And then furosemide, it does suppress lactation, so you can prescribe it for rebound high pressure, but then you just have to talk to your patient about how it suppresses lactation and weigh the risks and the benefits. And then, of course, standalion tea is safe to use in lactation. And then conception after treatment. So, uh, so patients can start conceiving within the first month after treatment. We generally recommend the woman being on top during sexual intercourse. Thought this was a funny comic uh, strip. The husband says, not going to work this morning. The wife says, I have a doctor's appointment. He says, is something wrong? She said, I don't think so. I just thought I'd get a checkup. She said that she thinks she's pregnant. Isn't that a hoot? Isn't it hysterical? And then, you know, the husband's face speaks for itself. <laughs> So lastly, with in vitro fertilization, um, Dr. Freeman also broached this subject in her grand rounds yesterday. Is there a link with fertility medication since it does stimulate ovulation with progesterone and estrogen? Is there a link to it? There's not a lot of scientific evidence. So there are, these are the medications that are typically used in IVF. Um, doxycycline has been used to enhance fertility treatment um, and it has been linked to IIH. So, um, there's not a lot of studies on it, so typically we recommend we leave it up to the clinician um, whether, you not, whether or not you recommend your patient to proceed with IVF after treatment or if you get post-procedure or post-operative scans afterwards. So that's up to the discretion of the clinician. So to wrap it up, just a couple more case studies. Uh, JD is a 40-year-old female who suffered from a gradual onset of a new type of generalized head heavy headache in July 2010. She noticed the headache uh, when getting up from a kneeling position. She also had a headache when standing and coughing. Uh, she had associated symptoms, including muffled hearing, swishing sounds, back pain. She was diagnosed with SIH in August 2010. Uh, found to have an abnormal brain MRI. She underwent a blood patch in October, so two months later, which provided temporary relief. She presented to our clinic in January 2011. Her brain MRI showed brain sagging, minimal brain sagging, some pachymeningeal enhancement, very minimal. 
And then our MRI myelogram showed uh, both a ventral and a dorsal uh, CSF leak in her thoracic spine. So she underwent a blood patch um, in, on January 27, 2011. She did very well. She had rebound high pressure headaches for four months. That was treated with acetazolamide. Uh, we repeated the brain MRI shortly thereafter, which showed resolution of the pachymeningeal enhancement. A couple years later, she did undergo IVF, did no complications with that. And a year later, she became pregnant with her first child. She decided to proceed with C-section under general anesthesia. She did have a TAP lock, which provided excellent relief of her pain. And currently, she's doing well. So this is a case study where a patient had a leak, she had a blood patch, felt great, um, underwent IVF without any issues. And again, it is reasonable to undergo C-section under general versus spinal because her pain was you know, uh, relieved with a tap lock. So it's a reasonable option. Uh, another case study, NS is a 44-year-old female. She was diagnosed with SIH in 2015 due to an abnormal brain MRI, three months following the vaginal delivery of her son without an epidural. Uh, further neurological workup revealed a thoracic meningeal diverticula, and in December 2015, she was advised to increase caffeine, some bed rest. She didn't have any improvement of her symptoms, so she decided to undergo a CT myelogram, followed by a fibrin glue injection um, in May 2016. She felt better, but not 100%. So she repeated her brain MRI after the glue injection, showed no improvement of the SAH findings. However, but between June 2016 and spring 2017, her headaches improved. She did find out she was pregnant in March 2017 with her second child, and her headaches gradually resolved in the first trimester, which was similar to, our prior, to the prior case study where her headaches also resolved in the first trimester. And then two months later, she repeated a brain MRI that showed improvement of the SIH findings. At the time, she was 10 weeks pregnant. She remained headache-free at that time. So interestingly, she did decide to undergo vaginal delivery without an epidural, God bless her heart, of her second and her third child. No complications from that, no reoccurrence of her headaches. So I thought this was a pretty interesting case because she had a leak, her brain MRI improved, and again, her headache spontaneously resolved in the first trimester. She underwent vaginal delivery, and there were no complications. So, um, you know, it's pretty fascinating. And then the last case study, Anne is a 27-year-old female, suffered from a fall at age 14, had lower back pain, leg numbness. She didn't have any headaches. Uh, but the MRI scan showed Tarloff cyst in her lumbar and sacral spine, uh, concerning for a spontaneous leak. She had a fibrin glue injection, provided 10 years of relief. Age 23, her lower extremity uh, numbness and back pain returned. She underwent another fibrin glue injection. So she came to our clinic in October 2018 to discuss the preferred method of delivery because she was 26 weeks pregnant at the time. So her MRI of the pelvis revealed bilateral dural ectasia um, along the sacral nerval roots. So it was recommended to undergo cesarean section under general. She underwent an elective C-section. Uh, no complications, recovery went well. Again, she underwent a tap lock. Um, her pain was well controlled with Tylenol and that. And currently, she's 12 weeks pregnant and wishes to proceed with an elective C-section under general. Again, another reasonable option. Um, her pain was... Uh, well controlled with Tylenol and a tap lock. Um, and also in this case, we would probably recommend a C-section under general because her dura, with the dural ectasia, we would think her dura is very friable. So it's probably best to just go with a C-section under general. Uh, so in summary, uh, the diagnostic workup and treatment of SIH in pregnant patients and postpartum is similar to non-pregnant women. So you would just keep in mind the gadolinium, whether or not you would want to order that with a pregnant patient. Um, also, if you want to use fluoroscopy or not with epidural blood patching, uh, with surgery, we would have to use fluoroscopy, but we would probably just modify how we would do that. And then we would recommend to defer the DSM and CT myelogram after delivery. Uh, Diamox, Lasix, and Dandelion tea are safe for pregnant and lactating women, and vaginal and cesarean section delivery under general or spinal are all reasonable options for methods of delivery. And then we prefer spinal if they do decide to uh, proceed with C-section. We prefer that over uh, an epidural anesthesia for vaginal. And I don't want to forget the dads with CSF leaks. So this is just a patient of ours uh, who had a CSF leak we operated on, and he gave birth to a beautiful baby boy. Thank you for your time.